All right. Welcome everyone to a very special bonus episode of the One Minute Scripture Study Podcast. We have the amazing Brian Hales uh, being interviewed today and talking to us about his book, Joseph Smith's Polygamy, and his knowledge about this really interesting, really sensitive issue. So welcome, Brian. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, and we would love to, as we get started, have you introduce yourself um, just in general, but also introduce how in the world you decided that this would be a topic you would spend your life studying and writing books on. Well, I have to admit right up front that if I were going to be known for something, it would not have been my original choice to have it be polygamy. (laughs) Um, But I am an anesthesiologist. I work full-time at Davis Hospital in Layton, Utah. And uh, back in the late 80s, a member of my family was excommunicated uh, for joining a polygamous group. And at that point, I became interested, uh, even followed along. I uh, read the things she was reading, and all, I was never convinced uh, on a number of points. But I realized that there really hadn't been very much uh, written on this topic. And that's how I became uh, originally introduced to it. I, it started off with me just writing on Mormon fundamentalism, mm. uh, you know, Warren Jeffs and the Allred Group and these kinds of things. And then people would ask me about Joseph Smith and plural marriage, and I didn't know the answers. And I, there were some books written, but most of them portrayed Joseph negatively. Yeah. In fact, all of them did, uh, honestly, in that period. And so uh, in 2007, I jumped in to researching Joseph Smith's polygamy. I hired Don Bradley, an incredible scholar and researcher, and he went out and found all of the documents that uh, we could find. And even, uh, and and these were compiled and published in 2013 into uh, my trilogy here. Yeah. And I tell people these are part of my full anesthesia services. So (laughs) don't always recommend them uh, to, to people. The, uh, the shorter version, the paperback that you were referring to is just fine. But uh, seven years, eight years later now, that after these books have been published, there really hasn't been a lot of, of new information coming out. And that makes Don Bradley and I very pleased that, that there have been a couple of new things, but not a great deal of stuff that we were trying to get all the information, transparency on this topic. We tried to create that in, in the trilogy. There's there's all three of them here. I don't know if you need me to show it. Um, they're sold at Deseret Book. They're sold online. Again, I just recommend the short version. But um, so anyway, that's kind of the, the short version of, of, uh, of my saga with plural marriage. So. Well, I think one of the things that I love so much about the book, and I'm excited to hear how, how was it Don Bradley? Yes. That he helped you so much was was the amount of research that went into the book. Like I was blown away. I told my husband, I'm like, they're detectives. Like, look at this, look at what they found. There is so much great research that went into it and so much supporting research. It's not just one document that we're relying on. There's just, there's so much to it. So I love that you guys did that research because man, that helped me so much to realize, okay, this is, this is a great resource. And even the church, um, links to your website, right? Doesn't the church link to your website for information on polygamy? Do you know, there's, there's just a handful of, of non-sponsored sites that they uh, promote for their CES uh, instructors, Institute and Seminary, yeah. and our Joseph Smith's polygamy.org made that cut. So we were very happy for that kind of an endorsement. If there's anybody we want to be pleasing, it's yeah. brethren. So <laughs> oh, goodness, that yes. Nice. That is like the ultimate. Oh, that's so awesome. Well, as we get started here, um, one of the things that I was asked, and I, I asked my audience, like, what do you want to hear about? I've got an expert on polygamy that I'm going to be talking to. What do you want to know? And a question that I got repeatedly was, how in the world do you explain this like to children. So, so how would you like polygamy 101 explain why this practice had to be a part of our church history? Well, it, it's a really good question. And I'll be honest with you right up front. I don't know that the answer is as satisfying as we would like. I was talking with a church historian a couple of weeks ago, and he pointed out if people have questions about this, the seer stone, you could research it and you discover that the interpreters Joseph Smith used 
uh, were just two seer stones. And so you can become reconciled to that's not that big of a deal because we already accepted the interpreters. So right. not a big deal. But when you get to plural marriage, you can come to understand it. And I think I'll be able to share a bunch of things today that will help people reconcile themselves to it. But even when I recommend this book to people, I tell them you will be informed, but you probably won't be necessarily comfortable with everything, mm -hmm. primarily because plural marriage is unfair. A man can do it, a woman can't. There's no way to reconcile that fact. And, and in today's culture where we're, we're so socially sensitive about any inequality, there, there's just, it's always going to be uh, something that, that we kind of have to in, in endure rather than fully understand. Mm. But to more fully address the question, section 132 actually gives us four reasons why plural marriage could be practiced in our day uh, versus 40 and 45 talk about a restoration of all things. And apparently, plural marriage was one of the practices that God wanted restored. Uh, verse 51 in section 132 talks about how plural marriage can be a special trial for individuals. And we all know God generates specific trials for people to overcome, and then they get extra blessings. Um, verse 63 is a very important uh, verse because it tells us that one of the reasons is to multiply and replenish the earth. Sexuality was expected, uh, but it wasn't the primary focus. It never was. And I think we'll talk about that more in a minute. The fourth reason is in verses 16 and 17 that tell us that every exalted being will enter the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And theoretically, uh, plural marriage could facilitate that process, although we really have few details and our current church leaders have never mentioned it. So anyway, those four reasons are why plural marriage could be introduced in the church or practiced among church members in our day. But none of them tell us why God commanded it. And section 132 does not command plural marriage, and we'll talk about that, I think, in a minute. But it does uh, command eternal marriage. And so we all need to practice that uh, to be exalted. And that's why these ordinances are made available in temples today and by proxy for those who've already passed on. Uh, but we don't know why God commanded it. That's, that's a take home here. God gets to command whatever he wants to, when he wants to. He commanded strange things like animal sacrifice or circumcision. And for a period of time between 1840s and 1890, he commanded uh, the Latter-day Saints to, to engage in this practice of plural marriage. Yeah, I appreciate that, that straightforwardness, that clarity on that. Um, you mentioned one of the commandments is about eternal marriage, though. So I'm curious, what I have heard a lot growing up is that polygamy is something that might be practiced in the eternities. I remember having random conversations with girls in my young women's class of like, I wouldn't want to share my husband, oh, like just kind of throwing these things around. So I think a tricky question a lot of us have wondered about is polygamy a celestial law? Is that something that, in, in your opinion, will be something that we might have to uh, practice in the future? Well, let me point out that we know almost nothing about eternal marriage. We don't understand how a, a couple, heavenly mother, heavenly father, interact, how, what their roles are. So to try to imagine eternal plural marriage, again, just takes us further away from anything that we actually know. Yeah. And there's been a book published that, that creates fear for Latter-day Saints about polygamy in the future. And it, it's completely theoretical. The author shouldn't have written it. Uh, and it, it, it just creates needless fear because God has told us if we are obedient, we will have eternal happiness and joy. And we can believe that. And these discussions about plural marriage in the next life and whether or not we believe that uh, it, it would be onerous to women, as it is on earth, we admit that, but, uh, these are speculations that have no use, usefulness at all. So I, I would just encourage us to trust God when he says, be obedient, and there it'll work out. But let me also say this. Um, in 1915, I think it was, President Joseph F. Smith, he was church president, was uh, brought a case between a man and a woman who'd been sealed in the temple, but they weren't getting along. And his response was, uh, let them separate, 
and find individuals that they can be happy with. Now, we don't hear this taught a lot because it advocates divorce. I've been divorced and remarried, and, and so I can understand those, those, those feelings. You don't want to encourage this. But then he said this. He said, the power to seal is also the power to loosen. And personally, I believe that prior to the resurrection, there will be a lot of loosenings and, uh, and resealings or sealings done by proxy, uh, but under the direction of individuals who, who are making these choices, so that, that prior to the resurrection, every man and woman who is worthy will be in a relationship and a marital dynamic of their choosing, and that they will be comfortable with forever. And that's, that's my own personal feeling, but, but it, it, the power to seal is the power to loosen. These, these things can be adjusted according to our agency as if we are worthy. That's fascinating. And yeah, I, I do fully believe in agency. I think that's something I've learned a lot recently is God's going to let us choose all the time. <laughs> and I think that includes the attorneys. Okay, so let's, if you don't mind, let's jump back to Joseph Smith. Can you give us a little bit of a history, a little bit of rundown, especially for those who honestly might not be familiar with the fact that Joseph Smith even practiced polygamy? Um, what did what did that look like as we progressed through polygamy in Joseph Smith's time? How did Joseph Smith start this as much as we know about it? And what different types of polygamous marriages did he have? One of his plural wives, Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner, reported Joseph telling her that an angel came in July of 1834, commanding him to restore this practice. And we have an account that at that time he was on Zion's camp, so he was, he was in Missouri, but at that time he, he didn't know where we would go to even find a plural wife. He came back to Kirtland and eventually he married a girl named Fanny Alger. She was, I believe, 19. I think it happened in, in no earlier than 1835, which would have made her 19. Um, we don't know exactly when this marriage occurred, but there's a good account that uh, he went to her parents by way of a mediary to get permission. Uh, and then there was a marriage ceremony performed. Um, we just don't know if this occurred before or after Elijah restored the sealing authority. And if it was before, that was April 3rd, 1836. If it was before, this would have been a priesthood marriage only for time. If it was after, it could have been the first sealing. And we can speculate all we want, but we honestly don't have answers to these questions. Well, Joseph did it, apparently naively thinking that when Emma found out about it, she'd be okay. Um, and she wasn't. And she caught them, according to one account, together. We don't know what they were doing, um, having the ceremony or, or having some intimacy. We don't know. But she reacted very violently, and I think we can understand that. Uh, and so uh, she cast uh, Fanny out of their house. Fanny Alger had been invited into their home probably early, late 1834, early 1835, to be a domestic or just a helper there. And uh, she was cast out. Eventually, Fanny uh, joined her parents and, and left the church. But um, Joseph then learned that Emma wasn't going to accept plural marriage easily, and what wife would, you know, in that circumstance. So for the next several years, we hear virtually nothing about plural marriage until 1841. At that point, uh, Joseph Smith has a second visit from an angel. And what's interesting is Joseph is the only one practicing plural marriage in Nauvoo, and most of his initial sealings, and these are all done secretly, but we have accounts from the participants later, um, most of these are to married women. And uh, a lot of critics are looking at these sealings saying, oh, well, you know, Joseph, they assume, the critics do, that he's driven by libido, so he wants to expand his sexual opportunities with married women, so he introduces plurality of husbands, and he gets to be the second one. All of that is speculation. There's no proof of that. In fact, there's good evidence that Joseph would not have tolerated a plurality of husbands, and he never did uh, engage in that. But he did... Uh, have ceilings with these women that were just for the next life. They're called eternity-only ceilings. Now, that's a new idea to us today. We've never heard of that, generally, and only he and a few other people in Nauvoo actually had those kinds of ceilings, but Joseph had the most. 
but I believe that he's choosing to be sealed to these married women for the next life only because there wasn't sexuality and it wouldn't hurt Emma's feelings. And uh, then we hear that the angel came a third time, and this time it was with a sword, not a flaming sword, okay, just a sword, but to emphasize God wants the real plural marriage established as a practice among the Latter-day Saints. And this was in early February of 1842, and this is the time where we first see Joseph proposing to single women and where we can document sexual relations in those marriages after they occur. And so uh, that's kind of a, a quick rundown. By the end of 1842, there were only three polygamists in Nauvoo total. By the end of 1843, we're up to almost 30 men and 85 women. So it expands, but still at Joseph's death, there were only 135 pluralists in Nauvoo. And so it wasn't like uh, this town of 15,000 or 12,000 people had this huge undercurrent of polygamy. That wasn't the case at Joseph's death, even though, again, some critics want to say that this was this big secret thing. Well, there were, there were maybe 200 people total who knew about it in a town of probably 12,000. So that's the quick rundown. I, I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep there. Um, <laughs> Not at all. That was perfect. Yeah, that was yeah. perfect. I don't think anyone's falling asleep with this as our topic. You're <laughs> totally fine. And I actually, one of the things I loved in the book was that near, gosh, the middle, there is this summary of his plural marriages. And as I went through and read the book, I inserted all of the little things that you said about like what had happened around those times. And as I filled this in, I got this picture of Joseph being absolutely torn between the God that he loved and the wife that he loved and just trying to do his best to please both of them. And it was impossible. It was literally impossible for him to please both of them in this matter. And that was one of the things that, that got me is, is understanding more of what an emotional roller coaster this was for Joseph and how much he didn't want <laughs> to be the prophet that this particular thing was restored through. So I appreciated that so much and how clear you made that in the book. One thing you mentioned, and I think Callie might have mentioned this too, is that there was deception. Joseph was not totally honest, including with his wife. And there were times when he was asked if he practiced polygamy and he said no. And, and I think we have a hard time reconciling that with him being a prophet. And so why... And I'm sure a lot of this will have to be your opinion, because as you've mentioned, there's so little documentation. But what is what is the evidence we have for why there was so much secrecy? Um, I appreciate that question. And it's a question that I have heard so many times. Mm -hmm. And especially critics will dredge it up as evidence that Joseph was a liar. Right. And they imply some big network of, of people deceiving to hide this, this practice. That's, that didn't happen. And part of the reason I'm comfortable saying that is if you can let me share my screen, is that something I can do? Let me see real quick. I think I can give you that permission. Okay. I just gave you that permission. All right. Um, this is an article that I put together and it can be downloaded uh, from my website, mormonpolygamydocuments.org where I've posted it there. But I looked at every single denial from Joseph Smith or church leadership. And believe me, there are a few places where Joseph is trying to not admit it. And you could argue he's using deceptive language, but at the same time, uh, he, this, this doesn't bespeak him uh, carrying on a, a lengthy deception with blatant lies or anything close to that. I frankly am more worried about some things Hiram Smith said than from what Joseph said, and even Emma, uh, but it's all there. So before we start assuming Joseph was this big liar on polygamy, we, we should contextualize it to the few things that we know about, and, and it's all there in this article. And now I don't know how to get, oh, there it is, stop sharing. Okay, now we're back. So anyway, I we could talk a lot about it, but. But the assumption I don't think is valid that he, he was doing a lot of lying. Uh, he, he wasn't totally forthright. He, he was holding back, but only because he didn't want to uh, have the law 
which actually would not have been critical of plural marriages, bigamy was against the law in uh, Illinois in 1840s, but since the plural marriages were spiritual marriages, the government would not have recognized them as natural marriage. Oh. So bigamy, polygamy, that, that would not have yeah. been the, the prosecution's point. They, they would have gone after a statute of, of adultery. Open adultery was against law. And some of these marriages were consummated. And, and uh, the, the enemies of the church knew this. And that was their point. That's what brought Joseph Smith into Carthage, at least one of the reasons. Right. Um, it wasn't a charge of polygamy or bigamy. It was a charge of, of adultery with uh, one of his plural wives. Mm -hmm. And Joseph knew this, and he'd been in jail before. And so he's trying to avoid uh, acknowledging that fact uh, without lying. But as you go through these, these few accounts, and I think there's 19 total, but not all of them are from Joseph, less than half, I think. Uh, you could read the context and, and decide for yourself what Joseph is doing. So. Mm. Well, and, and the second half of that question that I want to make sure that we touch on, because I think this is important to women. And, and even in my book, in so many different places in the margins, I write, oh, poor Emma, poor Emma, poor Emma, because he was not totally forthright with her and, and hid many of the marriages from her. And my takeaway from the book was simply that this was a man doing the best he could to keep his marriage together while still obeying God that he was just very imperfectly doing what he knew God wanted him to do and trying not to hurt his wife as he did it. Would you agree with that assessment or how do you see it? Well, I think we're right to feel bad about Emma. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she was in a different position. The, the people around Joseph, the men who were said, you need to practice polygamy, God commanded it. They could all say, Joseph said it was a commandment from God, but for Emma, Emma could worry that maybe Joseph had his eye on another woman. I mean, and that maybe this didn't come from God, or maybe he thought it was from God, and it really wasn't. So Emma was in a unique position. But as I see Joseph getting these eternity-only ceilings, non-sexual, for the first year or so, um, there was one or two exceptions, but that was the bulk of them. I see Joseph trying to be kind to Emma. Mm -hmm. And then Emma did uh, go along. It, it didn't last long. She participated in four plural marriages, and we believe she authorized a fifth. But she turned very much against uh, the practice of polygamy. And what's interesting is the last nine months of Joseph's life, we know almost nothing about what's going on in the, in the mansion house. Joseph is there with Emma. Emma knows all about polygamy. Several of Joseph's plural wives are there. Is Emma keeping Joseph from those plural wives? Is Emma regulating his interactions with those plural wives as normally would, you would think could happen? We have no idea. But we do know this, that when Joseph Smith was on his way to Carthage and martyred him, and he, he went to Emma and he said, Emma, come with me. I don't want to go alone. He, he didn't go to the other plural wives. He's confiding only in Emma. We don't have him confiding in any other wife but Emma at any time. And Emma, with the children and all, she couldn't go. And, and so Joseph said, well, look, write a blessing, and I will sign it when you get back. That's what I can give to you if you can't come with me. And so she wrote a blessing that Joseph never signed because he never came back. But in that blessing, she said that she wanted to retain uh, her position by Joseph's side through eternity. So here's a woman who has put up with the worst that polygamy could offer, in my view, yeah. and who, uh, as he know, she knows the inside of, of plural marriage there, but she still believes Joseph was a prophet, and she still is, is with him as, as his wife. So whatever victimization people want to claim for Emma, and, and it's easy to see that she was victimized by this. All women are, if you, are, if you ask me. But we have to also take her faith that she stayed by Joseph's side and she stayed believing. Mm. That's a beautiful, beautiful point of view. And, and that kind of brings us to the second half of, of there's two of these very tricky questions we wanted to cover with you. And the second one, I absolutely adore how you guys addressed this argument that people have that this was a, a revelation that was sexual in nature, that the whole point of it was, you know, to satisfy men's lusts. 
and I loved you guys did math. And I'm not a big mathematician, but you guys did the math on, on um, fertility rates. And would you explain a little bit more about that and how that supports the idea that this was not mainly sexual in nature? This commandment was not all about that. Well, I, I think as we talked about earlier, one of the four reasons for plural marriage was actually to, to have, uh, have children. Yeah. And if you look at the society that has plural marriage in it, that society will grow more rapidly than a monogamous society. Mm -hmm. The individual families are actually smaller with each of the wives, but when you have most of the women uh, having children, the overall numbers go up. And so people will theorize that at least uh, one of the reasons God may have chosen to implement plural marriage in Utah mm -hmm. was because he had spirits he wanted to send down. And that was an idea that was promoted often over the pulpit and by, by members in Utah. The, the problem with saying that libido was driving Joseph, and, and let's, let's just step back one second and say, if I go to Cincinnati and I stand on a street corner and I ask people, I, I, I ask them this question, Joseph Smith introduced polygamy among the Mormons. Why do you think he did it? Mm -hmm. 99% of the people are going to say libido. You know, yeah. he wanted sex. Let's, yeah. It's that simple. That's the default assumption. And we have to also admit, in, in some way, that may be the default assumption among church members. So as we try to understand plural marriage in the back of our minds, this is one issue that, that we need to try to reconcile, that Joseph Smith was not driven by libido. And I will tell you, the evidence is extremely strong that he was not. Mm -hmm. um, in all of my studies of, of our history, there are two positions taken by critics, which I think are extremely weak. One of them is how they, they portray polygamy insiders in Nauvoo in the 1840s. Mm -hmm. Because if any of them Eliza Snow, Zina Huntington, Brigham Young, John Taylor, any of these polygamists had thought for one second that Joseph wanted sex, okay, they would have dumped him. These mm -hmm. were people true to their own hearts, true to their Christian morals. They never would have gone along. And, and Joseph Smith wasn't having a lot of sex with these women. We don't have any children uh, associated with Joseph Smith. I honestly think he probably did father a couple. There's their accounts to indicate that he probably did, that they went by other names. But that wasn't something that was happening often for Joseph. And for the critics to say that the people around Joseph were just these gullible dupes and Joseph could say, oh, let's do polygamy today. And, and yet all he really wanted was to, to get in bed with more women and all that. And they just went along. It's nonsense. Yeah. You study these men and women. They, they had the same worries you and I have today. And they never would have gone along. And so when people assume Joseph is driven by libido, they're actually saying, hey, I can look back through time and I can see Joseph's motives, but Eliza couldn't see him, Brigham couldn't see him. See, there's, there's a breakdown, it's a disconnect. And, and for me, that, that doesn't work. So uh, if, if there's one thing I can help members understand is that Joseph Smith was, in my opinion, not driven by libido. He didn't want to do it. There's lots of accounts saying that, especially after what happened in Kirtland, he didn't want to go forward. That's why the angel came the third time. Uh, but once Joseph was uh, married to these women, he considered them his wives. They considered him uh, their husband and wanted to spend time with him. They wanted to have a family with him. I mean, that was their drive. And, and it was very much a family-oriented thing. And, and this can come out from studying the actual documents instead of, of giving way to this default assumption that everybody has about motives. Mm. And, and you didn't mention it, and I just have to mention it, like... I just think it was so amazing. You guys went back and you did the research on, on the number of pregnancies that resulted from Joseph and Emma's marriage. And then the number of pregnancies that all of the wives that he had had after he died. And the number of children that came out of all of these different marriages proves that these were very fertile people. And that if this had been mainly sexual in nature, there would have been so many more children from Joseph, if that had been his main motive. And so I love that point that, that we cannot assume that we see Joseph more clearly than those who were interacting with him every single day. I think that's so powerful. Thank you for that. So one thing that I appreciated in the beginning of your book is I feel like when we're talking about, even in the news today, there's this big thing against these news sources are so biased 
and biased is viewed kind of as a bad thing. But one point that you made in the beginning of your book is we have these facts, right? Like we have specific facts and specific, you know, primary documents that we have to work with. And then of course our biases are gonna help us fill in the story in between those facts. Like that's of course gonna play a role in it. And I love that you take a, a faith rate of faith based approach to that. So I'm curious, as you've studied polygamy and gotten into some of these hairy facts where the facts are even a little jarring, how do you keep that, um, that faith-based approach to it? How do you stay at peace with everything you learn? Um, the, when I started to research Joseph Smith in 2007, I had a number of individuals caring about me saying, you know, I, I don't think you should do this. You know, aren't you worried about what you might find? You know, I mean, it's polygamy, you know, and then Joseph's a man, you know, what, what, what might happen here? But in the back of my mind, I had a belief that Joseph Smith was not smart enough to create the Book of Mormon. And it was easy for me to believe he was a prophet in 1829. And I just don't believe that he ever lost the mantle. Now, Joseph wasn't perfect. And one of the disservices that we've had in our Sunday school classes over the years, I'm a lot older than you, so I can remember this better, but <laughs> is that Joseph was kind of put on this pedestal and as this great example, he would not have wanted that. He said several times, I never told you I was perfect and he wasn't perfect, but he was always worthy. And that's the message that, that I would say, and I was looking at all of this. Um, but once I got done with my polygamy research a couple, oh, about five years ago, I actually tested this theory about could Joseph have created the Book of Mormon? Maybe we'll come back to that. I'd like to talk to that. But, but for me, I just believed he started as a prophet, and I never found anything to make me believe he would have lost worthiness to continue to be God's mouthpiece and, and priesthood key holder here on earth. Well, I'd love to, I'd love to jump into that a bit. What have you found? I know you've been doing research on that more recently. What have you found about Joseph um, showing that he had to have received the Book of Mormon through Revelation and not through his own creation? Um, you know, this could be a separate podcast. <laughs> well, let's just really quickly, because we have previously done an episode where we talk about uh, linguistic fingerprints and all of these different, um, and, and we've referred to it uh, the way that um, John Hilton III does, as this is kind of the scaffolding that helps us as we're building our testimony of Joseph Smith. And so as we're talking about things that might hurt people's testimony of Joseph, can you help us with the, building some of the scaffolding that can help support our testimonies of him with what you've learned about Joseph's voice and his ability to write the Book of Mormon and what you've learned about that? I will share a screen with you that <laughs> is the result of my last five years of research where it compares uh, the skills that a person would need to dictate a long, complex book, and it compares them to Joseph Smith's skills in composition and oratory in 1829, and it, it finds a gap. Joseph doesn't have, according to the historical record, the skills that would be needed, and I believe God filled in uh, that gap with the Spirit and, and through revelation. And this handout, which I understand will be available at your website, uh, talks about the different theories and why none of them fit. And so this was what, this idea that I've now been able to test is what actually sustained me while I was doing that research. And I like that because I, I think you're right. We have, to, we have to build ourselves up with the good stuff when we're learning some of these other topics that might yeah. shake a little bit. They might shake that foundation that we thought was sure. Um, it's good to add other, other evidences to it for sure. Um, one thing, I just have to be honest, I have many friends personally who have left the church specifically over this topic. Um, and I'm sure 
many of us are in the same situation. This topic in particular is, it's a tough one. It's a tough one for a lot of people to swallow, especially with a lot of those little kind of soundbite clips that are all over about what we may or may not know about polygamy. Um, so I'm sure you have been put in this position many times. I mean, you've published works about it, but how have you found as a productive way to sort of defend the prophet Joseph when people come with uh, some of these really brutal accusations? The, uh, I think we kind of touched on, on the biggest one is that people are in the church are so willing to assume libido drove the process. And if they will get into the primary documents, you discover that that just didn't happen. And Joseph wasn't that good of a conniver. Or I would argue no one could be yeah. uh, because the people were watching him so closely, those that were involved with this. So the idea that libido is driving Joseph is, is a speculation that people will still uh, grasp because it comes so easy to the natural man, the natural woman. Yeah. But if we will get into the primary documents, don't get them filtered through some unbeliever. Right. Go right to them. And we quote them here. And if you really want to punish yourself, grab the trilogy. <laughs> but it's all there. And just read it. And, and you'll find these are imperfect men and women. And Joseph wasn't perfect. But you will find they were sincere, including Joseph. And that none of them wanted to do it. But they did it because they believed it was a commandment of God. Mm. And let me add, one of the big complaints that I have heard is that why hasn't the church told me these things? Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, until five years ago, the idea that Joseph was a polygamist was probably known by less than 3% of the church membership. Mm -hmm. It wasn't talked about in seminary. It wasn't talked about in Sunday school. We can, th there's a reason for that, that most members are not aware of. And I, I think I can share that now. And that is simply that if you study Mormon fundamentalism and that is what I wrote my first book on back in 2006. We learned that in 1904, the Second Manifesto stopped permission. And I, I would reach out to my fundamentalist friends. They're, most of them are great people. But when Joseph F. Smith stopped authorizing it, that stopped authorization. There is no authority outside of the church. And uh, this is an important point because having a personal revelation and uh, being very sincere doesn't create authority. And section 132 tells us in verse eight, eight, my house is a house of order. Verse 10, will I accept that which I have not appointed? Verse 18, if it is not sealed through him whom I have appointed, it is not valid. And my house is a house of order. Repeat it a second time within 11 verses. So the point is that there's one man who has these keys and and when they were not available after 1904 there's a period of, of a lot of members trying to get authority and they get them from church patriarchs who thought they had authority or they mm. get them from excommunicated apostles or they would just think that a burning bosom and sincerity was enough yeah. but then in the 1920s a guy named lauren woolley shows up with a story that back in 1886 he'd been given authority now there's all kinds of problems with this idea, and I've, I've written books on it. And, uh, but this idea united the fundamentalists. And so during the 1930s, they're, they're joining together, and they're getting a lot of press. In the 1940s, you know, Life magazine is there taking their picture with, you know, all of these, these polygamists. And, and the church is trying to distance themselves away from them and from polygamy. And at that point in the 1930s and 40s is where the church is just stopping almost all discussion about plural marriage. Now, we do have John A. Woodso talking about very, very uh, frankly, he was an apostle mm -hmm. um, in some of his books, but most of the official uh, publications are, are avoiding this topic because they want to avoid being associated with these, mm -hmm. these fundamentalist polygamists that are, that are in the news and and are doing things that the church, of course, church leadership uh, did, did not approve of. Well, enter the 1950s, enter the 1960s, 1990s, 2000s, this policy of just don't talk about polygamy is still in mm -hmm. place. The leaders have not chosen to send their historians after this topic. And so I show up in 2007 with Don Bradley, and actually some of the historians are going, we're so glad you're doing this oh, because God. they really haven't wanted us to do this. And, and I would argue it's not a cover-up. 
it's something that was started decades earlier to try to create some distance from these fundamentalists. And then uh, Don and I are able to get a lot of things out there. The church is embracing everything. And of course, now transparency is the motto regardless. I was not denied access to any documents that they had at the church history library every, in their archives. They, everything was open to us. So it's not a cover up. It's just a policy that needed to probably be changed earlier than the 2000s, but wasn't. But, but again, if church members feel like they've been betrayed, it's just simply because this policy probably went on too long. It wasn't a conscious decision by, by uh, living leaders to, to conduct the uh, discussion about plural marriage this way. So I think that's a, a lesson that we, we hopefully can take a little solace in, in knowing that, that there's not a cover up here that we can have this stuff out there. Polygamy is no fun to talk about, honestly, but, but nobody's trying to hide what Joseph did. Uh, it just was something that, in general, as a topic, nobody was wanting to talk about. I appreciate that very much, because, yeah, I definitely was not taught anything about this. And I've got to say, we've got one more question for you before we end, but um, for anyone who is looking for an in-depth dive onto this, this book, Joseph Smith's Polygamy, is absolutely fantastic. And I will say it's not comfortable. Um, when I started reading it, I just kept telling my husband, I'm like, I don't like this. I don't like this. Like, it's just a very uncomfortable subject. But I think the number one thing that I took that you mentioned at the beginning is that this has to be a spiritual quest, that you've got to let the spirit guide you. And even if, and we've talked about this, Callie, even if we can't make sense of it, that we can still feel peaceful about it. And so I just, I, I love that you have put this information out there so that people can get the information and they can seek for themselves that peace. Because I know my husband's like, oh, I think this is one time where ignorance is bliss. <laughs> but I think it, you're just doing such a wonderful job bringing it out into the light. So thank you. And I just have to say, I, on Instagram, every time before we interview someone, I ask if anyone has questions to, to add in. And, and I always get a pretty good response. But when I said, do you have questions about Joseph Smith and polygamy? I got a record number <laughs> of questions. Like, I think, and, and a lot of people said, and please don't sugarcoat anything. We want to know the truth. Yeah. And I'm like, yes, because I think you're right. We're in this age of transparency. Like people start hearing these things. And to me, it was when I read the saints book that the church put out a few years ago. That's the first time that I learned that Joseph Smith pra practiced polygamy and even like, maybe consummated a marriage and kept it secret from Emma. And all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, 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 what is going on here? I've never, mm -hmm. I've never heard this before. And so I think we're starting to hear these little pieces and people are craving truth. And, and that might not mean the full answer, but at least what is the truth? Because we sure have a lot of untruths out there. So mm -hmm. it, yeah, I think this is, I think this is going to help provide a lot of clarity to people. And I second the book as well, Joseph Smith's Polygamy. Yes. Well, I, I should point out that I'm just the co-author. My, my wife, Laura <laughs> Harris Hales, uh, who has a master's in, in uh, professional writing, was actually the one who did the final drafts of this. And uh, as I said, I, I've been through a divorce and then I remarried in 2013. And I, I told Laura that she was actually marrying into polygamy. <laughs> I, I didn't mean polygamy uh, practice, but just because it had been such a, a predominant part of my life. But she embraced it and helped write this. But I'll be honest with you, she is still not, I don't think, fully reconciled to it. And, and, here's, and we've, we've had people tell us as they're reading this that they didn't like it. But they knew Laura and I were believers, and so they plowed on. And, and more than one person that says, you know, if I didn't know you were as devout as you were, I, I don't think I could have gone through it all. Polygamy's hard. Yeah. These were imperfect people practicing a very, very difficult practice. And I've had some people tell me they, they, they leave. They say, I can't believe in a God that would command people to do this, this polygamy. I, I, I just can't believe God would do that, or I can't believe that God would command Joseph to do it without telling Emma. Mm -hmm. and, and my only response to that is, you know, it's interesting because you've been believing in a God who can be very unequal in other ways by sending a child to be born in Africa, 
uh, to poverty, a child born to privilege in Boston, someone with black skin, copper skin, white skin. I mean, if we look at the big picture, our God is not a God of equality. And if he commands somebody to do something that's hard uh, or, or places them in a position where they are facing great difficulties that others are not facing, I mean, we've accepted that in a different realm. And, and so we, it's the same God who's just commanding these people to, to show their stuff, to show their faith. One of the interesting things about Nauvoo polygamy is God was there. There are visions. There are dreams. There are angelic visitations. I mean, these were a very spiritual people, but they reported these types of, of very tangible spiritual experiences sustaining their entering and practicing plural marriage. And even if we can't understand why, it probably we can't understand any, any more than why we were born, when we were born, with, with, with the types of, of skin color and, and opportunities to know of Christ or, or, or not. I mean, there's lots of inequalities out there. This is just one that happened to pop up at a specific time. And I think we just have to have faith that God has things under control, whether it's polygamy during that period or where and when we are born on earth. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that, that brings me some solace on this topic. That is an awesome point of view on that. I love that. And, and the other thing I would just say is that it's okay not to feel 100% okay about something and that God can still send you a feeling of peace and you can still have a testimony of Joseph and really not be comfortable with polygamy because I'm not. And I still 1000% believe that Joseph was a prophet. So I, I just appreciate that so much. Well, to end every single one of our interviews, we like to ask this question. How do you hashtag hear him? You know, I, it's not, going to be a revolutionary answer but it's it's that peace that as i am going forward and and i felt it in in my writing you know being guided in directions and and helping to connect dots in ways that i i'm not sure i was doing it by myself but and and also feeling stupor when i'm heading in the wrong direction and and I would just say uh, it's 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 trying to keep the commandments, knowing I'm not perfect by any stretch, but uh, trying to keep the covenant, stay in the covenant path, and then just being open in prayer, but not just when I'm on my knees, but at all times and in all things, uh, and not even religious things. Sometimes I think God is there helping me at my work with my patience. Mm -hmm. uh, that that peace is there, and that 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 communion uh, is is. Some days just constant, and, and the other days I'm seeking it. So uh, that, that would be how I hear him. I love it. It's so individual. I love hearing how you hear him. That's awesome. Well, for our listeners, um, if you would like to get a copy of Joseph Smith's Polygamy, we will be including links in the show notes. Um, you can find your research, right? Is it josephsmithspolygamy.com? What's the website? Uh... Let's see here. <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> I, I, uh, I anticipated my ability to share this, and <laughs> I, I have 15 gigabytes of documents there. Every awesome. document that I, I, I invested nearly $100,000 obtaining all of these documents, and they're all there. It's oh, transparency. Man. If people want to think Joseph was underhanded or something, well, go ahead and look for it. Okay, polygamy mm -hmm. I don't like, but Joseph was a worthy prophet. But there are all of the documents. You can just find them right there awesome. on my website. And that's mormonpolygamydocuments.org? Org. 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 Okay, awesome. So mormonpolygamydocuments.org. We'll include a link for that below as well, as well as a link to that PDF about Joseph's uh, translation of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> Brian, you're amazing. This has been awesome. absolutely wonderful. Thank you so, so much for being here. And thank you for those who are listening for coming closer to Christ with us a few minutes at a time.